We are moving on from the death of Christ in the story of uh, the book of John, and we're moving uh, to the resurrection of Christ. I didn't change that slide. I'm sorry. I think the rest are right, but uh, we're moving on to talk about the resurrection of Christ this morning, and I want to begin by reading the whole book, uh, not the whole book, the whole chapter of John. The whole book would take a while. That would be a worthy thing to spend our time on. Um, But we're going to read the whole chapter of John chapter 20 together. It's 31 verses, so if you'll follow along as we read. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he might rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She Supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto his disciples his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, those are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed." And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life 
through his name. Let's have a word of a prayer and we'll, we'll jump right into this. All right, Heavenly Father, help us as we think about this passage of Scripture, this story of the resurrection, uh, to understand the importance of it, to understand what it means, what it means to us. And Lord, help us to realize the, the challenge that you've given to us in this chapter. Lord, give me power as I preach. Give me clarity of mind and thought. Um, help me, Lord, to speak clearly and give people ears to hear what I say today as we think about the Lord, as we think about the resurrection of, of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we spent quite a bit of time in John chapter 19 and moving into John chapter 20, moving from the great theme of the scripture, the death of Jesus here to the resurrection, I was a little bit worried about it, a little bit nervous about it. I didn't know exactly how to approach John chapter 20. And one of my big goals whenever I preach is to try to figure out what the author of the, of the book was after when he wrote that passage. I believe that our emphasis in preaching should match the emphasis of scripture, that we should just give you what the Bible says I don't want to impose my views on the Bible. I want to tell you what the Bible says, okay? Um, and John, led by the Holy Spirit, was after something when he wrote John chapter 20. And as I looked at this story, there are so many things that we could preach about. I'll probably preach on this chapter in this, uh, this theme of the resurrection for a few more weeks. Um, but the thing that I wanted to start out with was the purpose of the chapter. What is the purpose of the chapter? Why was this given to us? What is the deal about the resurrection? Um, and I think I found five purposes of this chapter that I'm going to give you this morning. Okay, so we're going to look at five different facets, if you will, of the chapter. The first reason I think this passage was given to us about the resurrection is this. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus is a necessary part of the gospel. The resurrection of Jesus is a necessary part of the gospel. Look at the last verse of John 20 again. It says, but these things were written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So the purpose of this passage about the resurrection is not a mystery. The purpose of this passage is that we would believe, that it would bring us to faith in Christ. And as we are brought to faith in Christ, we'll have new life in his name. The resurrection is part of the gospel. We must believe in Christ's new life if we want to get new life. Um, what is the gospel? I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me again. By the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about the gospel, um, or all about the resurrection. Um, but we're just going to look at the first couple verses here of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to notice what it says. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. So he's talking about the gospel. By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So Paul is saying, this is the gospel that we're talking about here. But he still hasn't defined it. He says, this is the gospel, and it is by believing the gospel that we're saved. Okay? Uh, notice verses 3 and 4. It tells us what the gospel is. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? So the simplest summary of the gospel is Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and then he rose again the third, the third day. And the thing I want you to see here about this idea of the gospel is that Jesus rising from the dead is not an optional part of this. It's not like we get to cut off the resurrection and still have the gospel. It is something that we must believe in in order to be saved. Now, we don't have to understand it. We just have to believe it. There's a difference. We actually see that difference in our text. Uh, you notice John. John always refers to himself as the one that Jesus loved. Okay? John and Peter are running to the tomb. John gets there first. 
and he looks from outside the tomb, and he just takes a, a, a glance, and, uh, and then he, it says that, um, the next phrase, as yet they, it says he saw and he believed, and then it says, as yet they knew that the scripture, or knew not that the scripture, uh, man, I need to just read that. I am misreading that verse, and I don't want to. Um, Verse number eight, then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Okay, so what's John saying? He's saying, I saw the empty tomb, I saw the grave clothes, and I believed, but I didn't yet understand what I believed. I didn't yet understand the meaning of it. I hadn't understood it from the scripture. And so you don't have to understand something to believe it. Um, I don't understand how my, my uh, sink works, how the faucet works in my sink. Like, where does that water come from? I don't know. I still believe that if I pull up on the lever on my sink, I'm going to get water, right? Um, I, I don't understand it, but I believe it. And what we're commanded to do is to believe, to believe. We also, we don't get to see it. Thomas was the last of the disciples uh, to see Jesus. He demanded to see, see and he, he didn't want to just see, he wanted to touch Jesus, right? He, he wanted um, Jesus to show himself, and Christ did show himself to Thomas. We're not going to get that kind of manifestation of Jesus. It's not going to happen. Okay, we are still commanded to believe. So I want to ask you, have you ever believed the gospel? Has there ever been a time in your life where uh, you saw yourself to be a sinner, you understood yourself to be lost, and you put your faith in Christ and Christ alone? You put your faith in what Christ did for you, that his death counted for your sins. When you believed that what he did on the cross counted for you, his rising again gave you new life, have you believed? Um, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. That's, it's, it's simple. Why not look to Christ and believe? Why not right now in your seat, if you've never done that, put your faith and trust in Christ and what Christ did on the cross for you? Believe that he can wash away your sins. Whatever sins you committed, however wicked you've been, all of those sins have been placed on Jesus' shoulders. He took your punishment, okay? And he proved it. He proved that he has power to forgive your sins and power to give you new life when he rose from the dead. So believe on Jesus. Do you believe? Have you believed? If you have believed and you believe for the first time today, then I believe you need to make that public. Um, God's way of doing that is believer's baptism. Uh, baptism, we had someone baptized last Sunday. Baptism symbolizes the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It, it, it symbolizes us being washed and given new life by the resurrection. Um, so if you have been saved, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, please come see me after the service and make that public. Profess Christ in baptism. The baptism won't save you, okay? It's the faith that saves you, but baptism is the way that we're commanded to make that public. The resurrection, first thing, is necessary for the gospel. All right, it's given so you can believe and have new life. That brings me to the second reason that we see in this story. And the second reason this story is given to us, this chapter is given to us, is so that we would see that the resurrection actually happened. It wasn't made up by the disciples. I believe that the reason that we're given so much detail about this story, so many different points of view, is so that we would understand that this is not some made-up fairy tale, this is not some hallucination, this actually happened, and there were ample witnesses of the resurrection. There are many details we could point out in this story that make the fact of the resurrection hard to deny. The first 
is the various ways that we see that the disciples responded to the resurrection um, is not, it's not the kind of thing that would happen if they were making it up. You read the chapter and you read the other accounts in the other Gospels and you see that nobody, was, no, nobody saw the resurrection coming. Right? You read about Mary. She, she and the other women that were with them are very upset because they think someone stole Jesus' body. They weren't expecting a resurrection. Even Peter and John, they're running to the tomb not because they believe Jesus has risen from the dead. They think someone stole the body or moved the body, and they're trying to figure it out. No, none of them believe right away. Every one of them needs to, to suspend their disbelief a little bit. And so you understand here uh, that all of these different stories, of course, we got Thomas uh, refusing to believe, Jesus having to show his wounds for people to believe that it was Jesus when he went into the disciples. All of, the, all of their disbelief is given to us here in John chapter 20. Um, and my point is, this is not the behavior you'd expect if people were making it up. If you go to court and you're trying to prove or disprove witnesses, if you're trying to make witnesses look bad, eyewitness testimony, there's a couple ways that you can do it. The first is if you have two witnesses and their testimony does not match up at all, right? If one says, you know, one person killed him and the other person says it was 55 people, both of those witness testimonies are going to get thrown out. The other way that you do that is if their stories line up exactly. If they line up exactly, that means they got together and they got their stories right before they shared it. You understand? And these firsthand accounts of the resurrection, they line up, but they don't line up exactly. They line up and they show the different point of view, how each person reacted to the idea of Christ being resurrected slightly differently. And that lends credibility to the story. Okay, so that's the first reason. The second reason, if the disciples were making up the resurrection, certainly they would not include Mary Magdalene as the first witness. I'll tell you something, this is not a good thing, but it's a, it's a historical fact. In the ancient world, women were not allowed to be witnesses in court. They were considered untrustworthy. And remember, Mary was not just any woman. Mary was a very troubled woman who had had demons cast out of her by the Lord a woman that was injuring herself. She is somebody that had a sinful life, a, a demon-possessed life. She was probably someone that everybody at some point before she met Christ thought was crazy. Surely, if you're trying to make it up, you're not going to include Mary Magdalene as the first witness of the Lord, right? People would have a problem with that. The reason it's given to us is because that's what happened. Third, if the disciples were making up the resurrection, we have to account for the empty tomb and the grave clothes. In Matthew's gospel, it tells us the tomb was covered with a heavy stone and that it was guarded by Roman soldiers. Those Roman soldiers were there on seal of death, right? They were, the Roman soldiers were there to protect the tomb or lose their lives. So the fact that the tomb is empty needs to be explained. And the most common explanation that people give for the resurrection, for the tomb being empty, is that grave robbers came in, or maybe the disciples themselves came in and robbed the grave. Okay, but again, the Roman soldiers. How did that happen? Well, let, let's say, this is totally unlikely, but let's say that the Roman soldiers were asleep. And the disciples somehow were able, or grave robbers were somehow able to get by these sleeping Roman soldiers at the risk of their own life, move this giant stone without waking them up, okay, um, you still have a problem, and that problem is the way that the grave clothes are arranged in here. You see, in those days, they would take uh, the people and they would wrap them up in these linen clothes, uh, with their arms crossed like this, they wouldn't cover the face, but they'd cover the head and they'd cover the body. 
and wrap them up in these linen clothes. And then they would take all these ointments and these aloes and these spices. Remember, Nicodemus brought 100 pounds of spices. That's a lot. And the effect of all of that, they would put all of that on the linen clothes. And the effect of that in that dry climate is very quickly that would dry out. And you would have something like a mummy thing going on here, okay, where the clothes were stuck together. And to take those clothes off after they had dried, you'd have to rip at them and tear them to get them apart. So remember, when Peter and John go to the empty tomb, the thing that made them believe was the grave clothes. Uh, There's a lot of detail here given about these grave clothes. They were arranged neatly, almost like a body was still in them. And this made no sense to the disciples. And it's what caused Peter and John to believe. So how do you account for that if this is made up? Fourth thing, if the disciples were making up the resurrection, how do you explain the spread of Christianity? You know, there is something supernatural that happened in the spread of Christianity. Christianity went from a few followers meeting on that first Sunday to thousands at Pentecost, like 40 or 50 days later. Within a few generations, Christianity had just basically taken over the world. God gave remarkable power by the Holy Spirit to these simple men, unlearned and ignorant men, uh, to share the gospel. And God gave them remarkable witness. And that is, I think, a testament to the resurrection of Christ. One more thing, one more reason. If the disciples were making up the resurrection, why would all of them take that lie? It's not a lie. But why would all of them take that to the grave? Why would all of them take it not just to the grave, but to a martyr's death? After all, all of the disciples gathered in that room, they all ended up living their entire lives in witness to Christ. And all of them, in some way or another, died for Christ. And we have, history tells us, that uh, some of them were stoned, Uh, Some of them were crucified. One of them was boiled alive. Uh, John, he had it best. He died of an old age in a prison camp. That's what history says. Okay? All for preaching Jesus. And you know what? At no point does history ever tell us that any of the original 12 disciples came out and said, we made this up. To me, that would have been uh, something that would be shared and shared and shared if they said that, and it never happened. They all uh, took the, the truth of the resurrection to their martyrdom. And we, the point I'm trying to make is we can believe the resurrection because it actually happened. It actually happened. Christ arose. He rose from the grave. It is part of the gospel, and it's part of the gospel that we are not fools to believe because it happened. That brings me to the third point. The third thing I think we see in this chapter that's so special is we see the graciousness of Christ. I think that that's one of the things that John intended with these stories was to show us the character and the kindness of the risen Lord. Notice verse 15, the very first words here recorded in this book of the risen Christ are, why weepest thou? Now, I don't think that these words were asked in a condescending way, like, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying? You know, I think Jesus actually cared for Mary and was concerned with Mary. And by the way, Jesus' resurrection was nothing to weep about. Right? Like, this is the most joyous event in human history. It was something to rejoice in. But Jesus tenderly asked her, why are you weeping? And then Jesus revealed himself to her with one word. By the way, the most beautiful word in any language is your own name. And I think Jesus spoke the name of Mary with all uh, kinds of tenderness and turned her skeptical heart into a believer in that moment. With one word, he turned her around. We see the care of Jesus. He wasn't impatient with her. He's tender and loving. I want you to notice something else that's interesting. If you look at verse 17, as he's talking to Mary, 
he, he gives Mary a job to do, and he says, Mary, I want you to go, and I want you to uh, share this news with my brethren. And we know from the next verse who he's talking about. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the disciples. Isn't it tender and, and special that Jesus referred to the disciples as his brethren? Then when Jesus meets with the disciples in the room, they're all locked in there, by the way. They're, they're terrified of the Jews. They think the Jews are going to go after them. So they're in a room. They're locked down. They probably have somebody at the door, you know, trying to guard people in. And I don't know how Jesus got into that locked room. I don't know if he walked through the locked door. I don't know if he just like beamed me up Scotty and appeared there. Uh, but all of a sudden, they're all in there. They're all worried. And all of a sudden, Jesus is just there, right? Now, Think about the disciples. Think about their performance of late. The disciples ran away when Jesus was crucified. The only one that we know uh, had anything to do with Jesus was the Apostle John. The rest of them are hiding out. They're afraid for their lives. Peter's denied Jesus three times. They could rightly expect the first words of Christ are going to be a rebuke. But notice the first words of Christ to them. He says, peace be to you. Peace. Jesus wasn't there to lambast them. He wasn't there to rebuke them. He was there to bring them peace. And it was like Jesus was saying, it's all right. Let's put all of this behind us. Peace be to you. Can I remind you, uh, Jesus mercies are new every morning, right? Great is his faithfulness. Our God is a God of new beginnings. He is not one to hold our past sins and our past offenses against us. When we come to Christ, he offers us peace. Then again, Jesus comes a week later, the next Sunday. It's significant, by the way, that both of these happen on Sunday comes again again, and his first words are peace. Now we come to the matter here of Thomas, doubting Thomas. How would Christ handle him? Can we all understand, Thomas has been a bit of a stinker here, right? Um, he's refused to believe. He said, I will not believe unless I can thrust my hand in Jesus' side and thrust my hand in Jesus' hands. I am not going to believe. Is Christ going to stand there and blast Thomas? No. Christ appeared to him and said, yeah, Thomas, why don't you look at my hands? Touch my hands. Touch my side. Christ is so patient with us. He's patient with us when we struggle to believe. He's gentle with us. He deals with our doubts. He cares about our emotions. He is so gracious. And I think we see that here in John chapter 20 i got to hurry. i got two more points, and i got to go really quick. Okay, number four. The resurrection of Jesus leads us to declare the deity and lordship of Christ. That should be our reaction. That's the natural reaction to the, to the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. And I think we can learn from Thomas. Someone has said that Thomas is declaration in verse 28 is the climax of the entire book of John. Look at what Thomas says here. He says, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. He didn't say my Lord and God. He emphasized it by saying my Lord and my God. When we see who Jesus is, what Jesus has done what he did on the cross, what he did in rising again, and when we believe in it, the logical conclusion is for us to declare that he is both Lord and God. Now, I want you to notice something here. Thomas called him my Lord. A Jewish person would never use that phrase for anybody but God. And then he follows it up and he says, and my God, that is, I mean, Jesus went to the cross for suggesting that he was God. They would have seen that as blasphemy to say that Jesus was God. Very clearly, 
Thomas is saying Jesus is God. And I want you to notice what Jesus does. Jesus does not correct Thomas. He doesn't say, oh, Thomas, don't go that far. Well, be careful, Thomas. No, Jesus confirms Thomas' belief. Look, this is, I'm sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm actually not sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, Mormons, all the other cults that teach that Jesus was something other than God. Jesus is God. He is Lord and God. And if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, how could he be anything else, right? Romans chapter 1, verse 4 says this. It says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So one of the things that the resurrection of Jesus Christ teaches us is that Jesus is God. And he has power or authority. He's our Lord and our God. So I want to ask you, is he your Lord and God? Do you live like he's the, your Lord and God? So the resurrection is part of the gospel. The resurrection actually happened. The resurrection shows us the graciousness of Christ. It shows us, or it leads us to declare the deity and lordship of Christ. One more thing here. The resurrection of Jesus leaves us with a job to do. When Jesus first appeared to Mary, she wanted to hold on to him and hug him. And Jesus said, touch me not. Now, I don't think Jesus was like weird in his resurrection body about being touched. Um, I don't think he was afraid of being defiled or anything like that. If you believe that, that's fine. Okay, I think what he was trying to do consistently throughout all of his interactions with the disciples was impress on them. This is not the time to worship me. This is not the time to just constantly talk to me, to cling to me. You have a job to do. Mary was to go to the brethren and tell them. Mary was the first witness of the resurrected Christ. And then Jesus appeared to the disciples. Remember that? He said, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. And then he tells them, receive the Holy Ghost. And he tells them um, what, they, what sins they remit will be remitted, what sins they retain will be retained. I believe that's talking about preaching the gospel, giving them the power to preach the gospel. Um, and they needed the Holy Spirit to do that work. Now, in the next chapter, we see Jesus again appearing to the disciples, and we'll probably talk about this in a few weeks, and he's going to give them a job. Remember that? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. You can turn another page into the book of Acts, and you can see Jesus gives the commission to be witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth, and then Jesus ascends up into heaven, right? I love this story. You know, the disciples are all looking at the sky. By the way, all of us would be doing what the disciples did, right? Like if Brother Hedrick is out there in the parking lot and he just supermans up into the air, we're all going to be like, what just happened? All the disciples are up there looking at the sky and angels speak to the disciples. And what do they say? They say, ye men of Galilee, what are you looking at? You got a job to do. Go do it right? You've got work to do. And that is the thrust of the whole, all of the interactions of Jesus with the disciples after he's resurrected. You have a job to do. In light of the resurrection, you have a job to do. Now, what is that job? That job is to make sure that everybody knows about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the death of Christ and what that means. The job is to Share the good news of the gospel. And listen, we still have a job to do. As believers, as witnesses of what Christ has done, we have a job to do. And that job is to share the gospel. We have a, a story to tell all the nations. We have a message to share with our neighbors. And the, I think what Jesus would say to us is, Get busy at the work. 
Get busy doing what I've called you to do. Don't stand there staring up into heaven. Get at it. So three questions this morning, and I'm done, all right? First question, have you believed? Have you put your faith and trust in the gospel? Has there ever been a time in your life where you were saved? Okay? Uh, if you haven't, I'm going to tell you what, what uh, Jesus told Thomas here in this chapter. Be not faithless, but believing. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Okay? Believe what he's done counts for you. Follow him in believer's baptism. Um, live for him. But it starts by believing. Believe the gospel. That's my first thing. If you've never done that, do that today. Don't put that off anymore. Second, are you living like Jesus is your Lord and your God? Are you living like He's your Lord and your God? Does your lifestyle, does the way that you spend your time, the things that you watch, uh, the things that you think about, do those line up with the testimony that Jesus is your Lord and your God? If they don't, you need to make that right. Third, what are you doing personally to share the message of Jesus Christ? What are you doing with this work that he's left us to do in light of his resurrection? Let's stand together and pray. Brother Hedrick, if you'll come and close us in a song of invitation, I appreciate it. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for the power that we have to have new life in Christ. And I pray that you'll uh, use the word this morning, that you'll use the message to shore up the faith of believers. Maybe there's someone here that's never trusted Christ as their Savior. I pray that they would uh, put their faith in Christ, that they would make that known, make that public. Lord, help us to live like you are our Lord and our God. I think most of us would say you're our Lord and our God. Help us to live like it and help us to be faithful in this task that you've given us to do.